All right, we will get started here now. So thank you again for everyone for joining us here today. My name is Glenn Engelberg, and I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment for the GEM, or Global Energy Management Program, here at the University of Colorado Denver Business School. And we're excited to have you join us today for part two in our Evolution of Energy webcast series, The Purpose. Um, and the purpose of this webinar is to understand the most pressing issues and trends facing the renewable energy industry here today. And to help us with this, we have Panasonic Cities, Director of Sustainable Energy, Yoon Lee, who will discuss the future of renewables in the energy industry. We'll also learn how Fortune 500 companies like Panasonic are revolutionizing the renewable energy industry and understand why it's important for alternative energy sources to coexist with oil and gas and along with other energy sectors too. Also, we'll find out how the Colorado and national job outlook is within the renewable energy sector and what to expect down the road. Yoon will then discuss a little more about his role as GEM's executive in residence. And um, additionally, we'll explore a little bit about the GEM program and how it gives students the tools and business skills to be the future of energy leaders in today's uh, energy realm. And of course, to deal with these changes. So to help us better understand the impact of renewables uh, with all of this, and to learn a little more about the GEM program, Yoon will go ahead and answer some prepared questions today that will help guide the conversation. And this is why the three-part webcast series is entitled The Evolution of Energy, How to Succeed in Today's Energy Climate. And we're really excited to present part two here today. All right, so before we get started though, uh, with our main feature of the panel's discussion and these questions uh, that we have for you to discuss this more, I'd like to quickly review some important information on the GEM program, just to make sure that everyone has the same context of how everything works together and then we'll begin um, here shortly. All right, so first, um, as many of you know and are familiar with the program, um, you know, there are a few very unique features about GEM. The first is that it is 100% energy focused. So unlike an MBA or something that's a little more general, all our content focuses specifically on how the business, leadership, or finance side works within all aspects of the energy industry. We are also an ACSB accredited institution, which is among the top 5% of, uh, of accredited business schools in the entire country. And further, uh, the blended curriculum delivery here is a hybrid online format. And what's really great about that is that it, it allows our students to continue to work full time while still going ahead and doing the program here on a part time basis and it's completed with 18 days, I'm sorry, within 18 months as well. Um, within that, we do have four days um, here that are on campus, which is over a weekend, and then the remainder of those terms are gonna go ahead and be in the online format for that flexibility. And that way you still get the kind of the best of both worlds to meet with your peers, network, et cetera. And a couple of quick facts here, we have over 400 alumni and students, and along with that, the program has been around for over 10 years, and we have our 21st cohort here starting in July, which we're really excited about, and we're actually still working with students for that cohort too, and I'll go over that in a little bit. One really important fact here as well in terms of return on investment or ROI is that actually by the time they graduate, 55% of GEM students have received a promotion or new job opportunity since they started the program, and a third of them have received a salary increase of at least 10% or higher as well, which is great. One thing I did want to show everyone here too is some different examples uh, that GEM students have had, um, that GEM alumni have had in the program. And even I know the first one uh, for the VP of Project Development, I know this particular student actually uh, was working more as, uh, as on the managerial or as on the engineering side and eventually transitioned to that role. We've also had students that are in director roles, commodity manager, as you see here, different leadership roles, but also with some of the leading companies in today's energy field like Tesla, Pivot Energy, Res Americas, uh, the National Renewable Energy, um, NREL, um, GE, of course the government, like the Department of Interior, the Department of Energy, and more. So a really wide variety, and even some that are globally as well, which is really exciting. So these are examples of some of the students here uh, with the positions and the companies that you go ahead and would be learning with and really benefit from. Uh, furthermore, with the curriculum here, uh, as you can see quickly, we have a total of 12 classes, and just a quick snapshot, nine of those are gonna be your core classes here, ranging from policy, leadership, or the finance side, or really essentially almost the um, energy business, or energy MBA side. And then you also will get uh, three electives to choose from, including our popular elective, where you can actually go to London uh, for a few days, and DC for a couple days to learn about international and domestic energy policy. 
And we even have a commercialization and renewable energy management class here as an elective that's taught by two former alumni who uh, work on the wind and solar side respectively. So you get a lot of great viewpoints that way too. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that class with you as well. All right, so without further ado, as I mentioned before, we have some prepared questions to help guide the conversation today. Before answering the, the first of these questions, though, I'd love you to go ahead and introduce himself here in a moment. Uh, he'll give a quick introduction with just, you know, his job, affiliation with GEM, and maybe a quick background of his career and current role with Panasonic. Uh, before that, though, just a quick note to our audience here. Uh, you'll go ahead and see that there is a chat box um, on the bottom of your screen, and you can type in some questions there. We are going to have a little bit of a time for a Q&A session um, here, uh, but you can go ahead and write them in there ahead of time if you like. Uh, and without further ado, I want to go ahead and um, hand it over uh, to Yoon to do a quick uh, introduction of himself, and we will uh, move forward with the presentation from there. So uh, without further ado, um, hi Yoon, uh, I hope you are doing well here today, and um, and we will go ahead and um, have you uh, say a few words um, about your background and go from there. Great, thanks Glenn. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, okay, I can't hear you anymore, Glenn, but uh, thanks everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, uh, so my current role at Panasonic, I am director of US Solar uh, and I oversee the solar projects business. We have a solar module business as well that's separate um, but the solar projects business consists of development, engineering, procurement, construction, and O&M for large utility scale solar power plants. Um, that's been my job historically. Um, just recently, I've also taken on another position, which is as director of sustainable energy solutions for Panasonic City Now. And, so, and City Now is Panasonic's smart city business. So in that role, I oversee origination, development, and execution uh, and implementation of uh, distributed solar projects, uh, energy storage, microgrids, and uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So that's been really interesting to see kind of both aspects from the utility scale side and the distributed energy side. And ultimately, ultimately our goal and mission here at Panasonic is to create technologies and and solutions that move us toward a better life and a better world. That's what we're about. And uh, we're at Panasonic, we're, we're inspired by the power of renewable technology and uh, trying to tap into that potential to, to solve our growing energy needs. So that's what we're about. Well, perfect. And uh, yeah, I could hear you before you and I just muted myself. So um, they could hear you a little better. And actually to go into our first question here, uh, being the awesome individual you are, you already answered two thirds of it. <laughs> but um, well, actually the first question, I know you told us a little more about your current role of sustainable energy at Panasonic City, and it sounds like there's a lot of great uh, revolutionary things that they're doing along those lines. But um, to go further to the, the goals and mission of Panasonic City, you said to go ahead and live you know, a better life. So I guess, can you, can you talk a little more about um, how you envision um, your role, helping with the mission, and the goals of Panasonic City and, and what that will look like. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it was our founder, Konosuke Matsushita, it, you know, his, his philosophy for, uh, for companies and businesses is that they ultimately um, provide a benefit to society. Uh, and so we've carried that, uh, that fundamental belief all the way through for the, for the you know, past 101 years. Uh, Panasonic is 101 years old. And so in this, specifically in the energy sector, we're looking to develop technologies and solutions that help, um, help accelerate that energy transition uh, to a more clean and renewable uh, and more sustainable future. Okay, perfect, yeah. And I know that there's a, a lot of you know, need and revolutionary things that, um, that they're doing with that as well. And to even piggyback a little bit, um, I know you mentioned beforehand that you were working more on the solar side as a director of solar there. And I'd like to do a little bit of a flashback. Actually, about nine years ago, I know you published an article that talked about um, pitched roof PV mounting um, in, in Solar Pro Journal, actually. And um, I was hoping that you could explain a little bit about what PV is and then discuss the evolution of PV in the past decade um, in terms of the solar industry. Sure, yeah, yeah, I can't believe I wrote that article uh, nine years ago. It seems like such a long time ago. Um, 
But yeah, uh, so PV just is short for photovoltaic or solar power. Um, and so that's specifically photo, uh, photovoltaic, meaning solar electric power, as opposed to solar thermal, which is entirely different technology. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, when I wrote that article, it, it's actually, um, my career is, is somewhat reflective of, of the industry as a whole. Because when I first got started in 2006, uh, solar was, a, was really a niche industry catering to homeowners and small commercial business owners who were concerned about the environment more than anything. Uh, it didn't necessarily make sense financially to go solar at that time. Um, but as costs continued to go down, you know, we began to do larger and larger commercial systems. And then I made the jump to utility scale solar with Sun Edison, uh, right as they were ramping up development. And so uh, solar has really evolved from becoming this niche uh, energy player into now a more established emerging uh, resource, uh, not, not just in the distributed space, but in, in the utility space as well. Um, and you know, looking back on that article, the reason why I wrote that article to begin with uh, was because uh, it was so new at the time, it was really unclear how to treat solar PV, panel, uh, PV panels when you're trying to figure out structural calculations, there was no standard way. Uh, so we were trying to apply existing codes and standards uh, to this new use case. And now of course the, the codes and standards have caught up as solar has become a more established industry. So, you know, I think at that time in 2006, the largest solar power plant uh, was in Germany and that was 11.4 megawatts, which was huge at the time. And now you fast forward to today and, you know, the U.S. has installed a total of, you know, uh, just, just this uh, past year, over 10 gigawatts were expected to install um, close to 12 gigawatts in 2019. So we've made some serious strides um, in this space. Wow. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's an exponential difference you know, right there, too. And actually, before going to the next question, um, uh, to piggyback on something that you said, you talked a little bit about the utility side as well. And, um, and kind of that effect with it. And actually just with the GEM program in particular, we have a ton of students actually from Excel Energy, actually I believe over 15 students and alumni um, from there. And I know that they are going to more towards our, um, renewable goals and those components. So um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that, about your involvement or familiarity with uh, the utility sector and how, um, how you anticipate that like kind of like solar, the renewable side will, will play into that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, historically, it's been on the utility scale side. So as uh, utilities begin to see solar as this established uh, resource uh, that's reliable, and um, almost more importantly, that it's becoming cheaper, uh, cost competitive to um, existing uh, other, other types of uh, generation resources. And so um, we've seen that, that trend. Um, there's been more and more solar and wind procurement as, as costs have really fallen. Um, you know, and it's, it's interesting to kind of see both sides, right? That, that's the utility scale side. On the distributed energy side, you know, we're talking to utilities about uh, you know, distributed energy solutions, aggregating those resources and, and, and you know, developing virtual power plants. Um, so that's a, a, an interesting discussion as well. It's, it's um, I think utilities uh, who are innovative and open are, are looking at, at all of those options. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I know that um, I actually saw Alice Jackson was at a, at an event that Jim hosts on um, her world. Um, and she was talking specifically about some of their goals. She's the president um, of Excel Energy in Colorado, uh, for those of you that don't know. So and I know she was really interesting hearing her take on that. And it's uh, just unbelievable in the past 10 years, how the goals and, the technology revolution has really changed that future. It's a little exciting to, to see where that goes. Um, on the, um, actually, on a little bit of a separate note, I'm kind of going to more a little bit about the GEM program and your participation in it, Yoon. Um, I was hoping you can discuss a little more about your role as the executive in residence here for the GEM program and, um, and a little bit also about, you know, on top of that, you know, in your interactions and dealings with students um, in the past couple um, terms here, and what's impressed you most about the GEM students that you've interacted with? Yeah, no, uh, it's been a really great experience for me as, uh, as EIR. Um, I'm you know, able to provide some insight and real life perspective into the renewable energy space uh, for the GEM students. 
Uh, so I really enjoy that. Uh, you know, in my role, I, I give guest lectures, I host group lunches to answer any questions. I have one-on-one -on -one office hours. Um, and I'm working, living and working in the renewable energy industry on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm happy to share that perspective and um, share how we're applying some of those principles that, that you guys are learning as a part of the GEM program um, in, in this space specifically. And I think in my interactions, what's impressed me the most about GEM students, it's, it's really the passion for energy, uh, just more broadly speaking, energy in general. Um, I, I think we can all recognize that energy is going through this critical transformation right now. And uh, we need intelligent and, and passionate individuals to really help us lead, uh, lead us through that, that uh, transition. So um, anything that I can do to help, um, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And it's been a great experience so far. Wonderful. Yeah, I know that's, uh, that, that's really great to hear. And I know that from the interactions I've had with several students, they really enjoy hearing your perspective and, uh, and everything with that too. Um, so actually talking, um, I guess on the note of GEM here, uh, for those that you don't know, during the four-day cohort weekend, which is a Friday through Monday, we actually do site tours about two to three times a year. And in the past, we have actually gone ahead and toured uh, Panasonic's on-site microgrid and city showcase that they have. I know that you're um, a big part of um, in that development now, Yoon. So I guess can you tell us a little more about what a GEM student could expect um, to see, like when touring the microgrid and city showcase and, and just what that would be like? Yeah, definitely. I, as Glenn, as you mentioned, if it weren't for that uh, bomb cyclone, we uh, <laughs> wouldn't have actually been able you to go. Out, yeah. <laughs> um, so Colorado weather is doesn't necessarily agree with us always, but um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I I have the pleasure of working in, in a very interesting office. It's a um, it's essentially a a a proving ground for new technologies, and I'll say not just new technologies, but also new business models for how we scale those technologies. Uh, and so for those of you that don't know, you know we're part of um, this development called Pena Station Next, 400 acres uh, right off of the uh, A-Line, if you know that, connects the airport to downtown Denver. And uh, you know we're really looking to push the envelope uh, when it comes to smart city technologies. So, on site, we've got a functioning microgrid with uh, solar on our rooftop. We've got a solar PV canop canopy across the street um, at the uh, airport parking, parking lot. Uh, and then we also have a one megawatt, two megawatt hour uh, battery energy storage system in our parking lot. And, um, and that, that really provides us all the backup power that we need for this building. Uh, Excel owns the battery. They're using it for several other use cases. So, that, you know, once again, it's not just a technology solution we're trying to implement, but a business model. How does Excel utilize that asset in, in different ways um, to be able to, um, to justify the expense? How can this be a reality, right? Not just like yeah. a dream, but how can this actually be fully functional on a grander scale, right? On a grander I mean. scale. How do we scale this across? across other developments, exactly. So, you know, the microgrid is one por portion of it that's specific to energy, but, you know, Panasonic City Now is all about the smart city. So that's broader than just energy. So you might see things like, um, we have an innovation showcase here where we're demonstrating uh, some of these smart city technologies, such as smart street lights, smart parking meters, you know, smart garbage cans, if you can believe that. Um, you know, and, that, and that's essentially a kind of, uh, it's an immersive environment. It's a, it's a micro city and we've kind of scaled it down. It's in our warehouse. So you can come and check that out. Um, and then you would have also seen some of the work we're doing in the connected mobility space. Um, and, uh, you know, we're obviously uh, le on the leading edge there working with uh, Colorado uh, Department of Transportation to roll out this uh, connected mobility platform, data platform. Um, and, you know, you would have gotten a ride on, a, on an autonomous and electric shuttle. So how cool is that? Um, well, see, now, really, now I'm heartbroken. You're, you're killing me. <laughs> that's, that's publicly available now. Yeah, so yeah. The, the next time. Actually, just um, um, before I forget, for those that aren't as familiar with, can you explain what a microgrid is? Yeah, of course. A uh, microgrid is essentially a, uh, a grid um, that is made up of uh, generating, generating resources at loads. Uh, and it and what defines it as a microgrid is that you're able to disconnect from the greater grid mm -hmm. and island and function independently. So 
uh, at, at uh, Panasonic. We have a generating resource, we've got solar PV on the roof, uh, and we have battery energy storage. Uh, and then, and so if there is a, a, an outage, uh, we are able to island, essentially. We're able to open that switch, disconnect from the greater grid, and operate independently. Yeah, it's almost like energy independence, I guess, right? <laughs> In a way. What it's about, independence and resilience. Yeah. Exactly. Two great trades for energy and for people, right? So <laughs> there we go uh, with that. Um, so actually, and kind of talking about that too, um, with the economy of the renewable industry, I'd like to segue there for a second. How do you believe the economy of the renewable industry in Colorado compares to other progressive states like California, Arizona? What's your take on that? Yeah, you know, uh, the renewable energy industry here in Colorado, I'd say is uh, middle of the pack, but growing. Um, you know, I think nationwide in, this, in the solar industry we have over 240,000 jobs. Um, and uh, in Colorado specifically, I think last year there was uh, about 6,800 solar related jobs and helped install about 1.1 gigawatts of solar. Um, and so, you know, we rank uh, 12th in installed capacity and eighth in number of jobs. Um, you know, and a lot of that is driven by several factors. It's, it's policy, it's, uh, it's also cost of electricity. Um, and so, you know, you compare that to a state like California, they lead with, you know, their first in the nation uh, with uh, over 76,000 solar related jobs and they've got 24 gigawatts of solar installed. So you can see the difference there. Um, and then, you know, Florida is next. They've got 10,000 solar related jobs, followed by uh, Massachusetts, New York, Texas. Those are some of the, the hot markets for, for solar. So I think Colorado, Colorado has a ways to go. Um, but um, I think with um, some of the renewed focus on, um, you know, uh, clean energy and sustainability, uh, we'll, we should expect to see that industry uh, growing uh, pretty rapidly. And also, we have the ultimate X factor. We have a lot of sunshine. <laughs> so, that's that's right. there, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Outside of San Diego, I believe we have the most sunshine out of any, any region in the country. So, I would only see that. I'd expect us to climb up on that chart. Um, yes. Um, not just with job numbers, but also, I believe it was a 24 um, kilowatts that uh, California has. We're a little over one. So, I, I expect that bridge to be gapped soon. So, yeah. well, great. Well, um, well, actually, and talking about um, solar, too, as well, I know, of course, that's not the only renewable energy. It's one of the, the larger ones. Um, but how would you say that the growth of solar compares to that of other renewable energies like wind, hydro, biomass? Um, where do you think it stands in that realm? Yeah, yeah. So solar has really um, accelerated in the past, I would say, six years or so. Um, so we, solar has ranked, uh, if you look look at the, um, the new capacity addition, solar is ranked uh, either first or second in new electric capacity additions uh, in each of the last six years. Um, wind, I think, if, if you think about renewable energy, wind has traditionally dominated uh, prior to that. Um, but uh, you know, in the past six years, I think five out of the last six years, solar has, uh, has outpaced wind. Um, so uh, I, I would say that there's still sort of neck and neck um, hydro and biomass are still relatively small, I would say, as far as new capacity additions. Um, so it's really, um, re I would say, solar and wind that have, that have really taken off in the past. Yeah, and actually with that too, um, just kind of on the topic as well, like I'm sure you know you deal with some uh, of the number crunching, the finances of it. How would you say in that the development in that regard in terms of cost efficiency, um, that like hydro versus wind versus solar, um, how would you say the advancement in that? that aspect stands. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Lazard does a really good job. Uh, if you don't know of Lazard, it's a, uh, they, they put together this uh, LCOE report, essentially comparing, uh, LCOE stands for levelized cost of, uh, of electricity. And so um, they put together this report um, on an annual basis. And so you could really see the declining cost of both solar and wind over time um, and that to the point where now it's uh, cost competitive with uh, you know traditional fossil fuel resources 
Um, and so um, if you're interested, I, I would recommend looking up that report. Uh, there's a lot of great information. Yeah, no, I, I have seen you know, some data on that too. I don't know how to interpret it in any respect like you do, of course, but it is really interesting to see how they really bridge that gap as well in some respects too compared to natural gas and some other things as technology has advanced as well. So yeah. I'm actually kind of on that note too, talking about the wind solar side, Jim actually has, of course, I believe one of the ones that you um, participated with a, a brief lecture, the commercialization management of renewable energy. Um, do you, do you do a, a brief lecture on that one, Yoon, if I'm not mistaken? I did, yeah, yeah. I had uh, that, that was a, a great experience. I had the pleasure of giving a guest lecture in that uh, elective course, and you know, I was telling the instructor afterwards that I really wish I had, you know, the ability to take that course prior to me getting into the energy industry. It just gave me a lot of uh, perspective uh, that all in one class that uh, I I've had to learn sort of the hard way just yeah. being in the industry. Um, so I, you know, I think it, that that course does a great job and it, it's incredibly important to understand the full value chain and life cycle for these types of renewable energy projects and uh, really understand the types of skill sets, you know, needed to bring these projects to fruition because you've got everything from, you know, land development, uh, financial analysis, you've got the design and engineering teams, legal, you need, you need construction expertise, supply chain management, asset management. Uh, the list goes on and on and every so component, right that's involved yeah. every nook and cranny so to speak exactly so i really wish i had that you know in a singular course that foundation that uh that kind of went through everything from start to finish so that i think that's a great uh, great course and would recommend anyone interested in the renewable energy space to to take that elective yeah absolutely and and now of course being the executive in residence here if you did want to take that course i may know someone you who could help out with that so we yeah can... <laughs> please yeah. yeah absolutely actually for those of you um, that don't know too as well what's really unique about that course is actually it's taught by uh jamie and jenny respectively who are two gem alumni from our third cohort back like in 2010 and jamie works in uh, works with vestus um, which is a large wind company more contract negotiation side and Jenny is a uh, director over at Res America, uh, which is focused more on solar. So you really get a couple really inter interesting perspectives there uh, from that, you know, as you, you was saying, on top of the whole, just essentially just life cycle chain, you know, all the components that are involved. Um, and, and actually kind of going back to a little more um, with Panasonic, you and I know you have experience working at some of the leading corporations in solar, like Sun Edison, uh, Panasonic currently. I was hoping you can tell us a little more about what do you anticipate companies are looking for in job candidates um, for the 6,800 and growing solar positions uh, in Colorado? And I think it's more importantly with that too, how do you see the GEM program helping students with these skills and, and networking relationships that would be important for these job opportunities? Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, the main thing uh, I've found is that solar to this day is still driven by you know, individuals, leaders, and, and companies with really a strong vision and mission uh, to, to accelerate the energy transition to clean and renewable fuels. Um, so having that passion, that drive, I think is really key to, you know, getting a position at any of these companies. Um, I would also say that um, they, it's, it's incredibly important um, for these companies to look for candidates that have a, have a broad understanding of the energy business and where solar and or wind uh, might fit into that uh, from, from, you know, kind of a grander level. Um, and, um, and, you know, solar, wind, they're still, you know, even though they're more established, they're relatively new technologies. Um, and so companies are really moving from, I would say, a startup mode uh, into growth mode. And so they, they really need those uh, student or, you know, professionals um, who have that business and operational experience uh, and that's exactly what the GEM program uh, provides. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and what's interesting about that too that I think you said and I'll be a comment here in a moment is that in understanding the entire spectrum because as you mentioned, you know, it's still a, in, I don't want to say it's infancy, but like, I don't know, maybe toddler stage or, you know, young, you know, uh, or kid pre-K, so to speak, if you want to use that school analogy where, you know, it's still on the cusp of that. So understanding the transition of how it works within the entire energy realm is really important. And with actually with the GEM program, that's one of the reasons why we teach utilities, oil and gas, 
renewables, you know, the entire spectrum. Um, and I, we have a lot of students that actually transition from one side, like oil and gas to renewables and vice versa. So I guess was that kind of more along the lines of what you were referring to when you were saying under the importance of understanding the entire spectrum and just knowing how it all works together, Yoon? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, perfect. Well, great, great. So, and actually, um, uh, one other question here too, before we go into uh, a couple of components about upcoming events and a Q&A session is that, um, I know, um, despite, you know, the growth of renewables, uh, of the renewable industry, and I know as we discussed, it's still, you know, growing and has a little piece of the pie, but not the majority, there's still a lot of fossil fuels like oil and gas, natural gas, as predominant energy resources. Can you discuss why the movement towards renewables is going to be a little more of a gradual transition and why oil and gas, you know, will still be vital to the energy economy for the foreseeable future as well and how it all works together? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, when I got my my start in the solar industry, is was, I was all about solar, and uh, you know, very much a, a solar advocate. Um, and what I've realized over being, you know, in the solar industry over time is that um, it, it can't be the end all be all solution for for everything, um, right? It's uh, you know, I, th I think we should accelerate as fast as we can to transition to renewables, but there are currently limitations. You know, initially the hurdle was cost, but uh, solar and wind have really come down to be competitive. Um, but the challenge I think we'll find is that as more renewables make up that energy mix, uh, you've got intermittency and reliability issues uh, that, that need to be overcome. Um, and, you know, solar is, is a unique resource uh, because it has that same generation profile and, and uh, you know, you're, you're basically putting the same resource on the grid. Um, it's unique in that each subsequent solar PV system installed is less valuable to the grid than the previous one. And, and the Kaiso duct curve is a, is a clear example of that. You know, you've got, uh, I don't know if folks on, on this webinar are familiar with the Kaiso duct curve, but you're essentially facing uh, lots of solar generation in the middle of the day and then you're facing a very steep ramp uh, when solar tails off and, and you've got this um, high peak demand in the uh, early evening. And so how, you know, how do you deal with that? Um, and you know, fast, flexible resources, that's, a, that's, a, that's gonna be key to address any of these sort of in, intermittency um, and ramp issues. Um, and so, you know, that's where I see natural gas generation facilities playing a role in this transition period uh, until other flexible resources like energy storage can be deployed, um, you, know, you know, cost competitively, essentially. So I think it's, it's going to be a mix of all resources uh, with the ultimate end goal of transitioning to a more sustainable, uh, cleaner grid. Yeah, absolutely. And actually on that too, um, when you say the difficulty of, let's say, peak hours, so to speak, um, I've had an, are you talking about just having the infrastructure of storage and um, the logistics, let's say, to get you know, solar from Colorado to Connecticut or to go ahead and store it? I guess, is that what you're referring to is still one of the bigger pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to solve? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a uh, it's an intermittent resource and, uh, and you're limited by the, your solar window, right? Uh, when the sun shines and so uh, you can address some of those issues through you know having geographical diversity right you can have solar pv plants that are powering uh you know the eastern port in, in, on the west side uh powering the eastern coast uh, but that requires a large transmission grid in order to to, to deliver that power um you know or you could use uh flexible resources right to, to help address the ramp uh ramp up and ramp down uh, of these solar resources uh, as they increase throughout the day. So um, it's a challenge. Uh, I think there, it's, it's a challenge that we can solve, uh, but it will take some ingenuity, some technological advances and cost improvements in order for that to happen. Yeah, and time, of course, with all that, the other most valuable resource besides money, depending who you talk to. <laughs> so yeah, but no, it is fascinating to see uh, um, how that will all work, but as I, like to joke around and see people who are like, let's go 100% renewable and everything now. It's like, well, that, that looks, you know, that's a great idea on paper, but I've never seen a Toyota Prius go ahead and drag a 50 foot wind panel <laughs> over somewhere or be able to stick a, you know, cup, you know, solar in a backpack and take it, you know, cross country. So really figuring right. out a uh, realistic structure in terms of logistics, cost, efficiency, and time is something that's still being worked on and having that 
um, almost universal grid, right? That everything can work together. So that'll be uh, that'll be really fascinating to see. Well, well, thank you so much um, for uh, for providing some insight on that. You know, that was really great to hear. And actually, uh, a couple other quick things here. Um, and I see we do have a couple questions here that I want to go over with the audience. But uh, before then, I wanted to let everyone know of a couple upcoming gem events. We actually have part three of our webinar series, um, which will focus more on the utility and power side. I know we talked about Excel Energy, companies like that, or um, um, and with that too, actually we have a couple gem alumni, uh, Keenan Austin and Brandon Blevins, who work in respective parts of that power industry, and actually Keenan works at Excel. That will be May 23rd from 12 to 1 p.m. And uh, for those of you that want to register for that, just like this one, please go ahead and shoot me an email directly. You'll get my contact information at the end or I'll go ahead and make sure to follow up with everyone here uh, with an email on uh, those details and registration link, because uh, that will be a really great one too. Uh, also, for those of you that are local or uh, will be in the Denver, Colorado area on Thursday, May 9th, a little over two weeks from now, we have one of our great annual events, which is a Gem Perspective Student Lunch. It's gonna be at Capitol Grill, where even uh, my wife who's vegan can find something great to eat at, so I know you can too. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll actually have um, a faculty member to there, several alumni, and actually Yoon uh, will be there as well too. So it's a great way to find out more about the program, interact with those that help shape it too to get better insight on it and see if it's a good fit. And, uh, and you can go ahead and contact me if you were, did not get an email for the RSP or registration link. And of course, no seats are limited because like anything else, Capital Girl, you know, and that stuff where there's a budget. <laughs> but um, we are, it's one of our great events and we're really looking forward to that here in a couple weeks. Also, uh, we have our 21st cohort here starting in July, on July 12th. And for those of you that are interested, you can go ahead and even sit in on a course, you know, contact me directly for questions on what that looks like. And we are still working with students for that uh, July, co July cohort as well uh, that we have coming up here. And on, that, and on that note too, actually, with that as well, Give me one second here. Okay, perfect. Yep. So just quickly for those that are interested or want to know, the application process here is very seamless, and I actually personally help out with that. It usually only takes about two to three weeks for most students to get everything done. And for those that have energy experience or even a master's degree, we can offer a GRE or GMAT waiver. Um, and for, even for those that you don't, you know, we can review that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but essentially, it's a quick process. Um, we have a turnaround time of one to two weeks as well for decisions. And that's something that in my role as the assistant director of recruitment that I help out with too. So if you are interested in the July or upcoming classes, our next one after that's in January of 2020, please contact me directly and I'll be happy to go ahead and help out with that. And as you can see right here, um, my, that is my contact information as well. Uh, my number is 303-315-8064 or glenn.engelbert at ucdenver.edu. Um, but we actually do have a couple questions here uh, from the audience. I'm sure you know we want to uh, we want to get Yoon's take on. So we'll go ahead and and get and get to that right now. And actually, uh, the first question here um, that, that we have uh, for you, Yoon, is talking about the difference between a uh, gem versus an MBA. So I guess can you talk about from from your perspective as someone you know who hires people who's in a leadership role, will you see the advantage of the gem program versus an MBA for someone that's looking to be in the energy field? Oh, sorry, one second. You know, I believe that um, you are currently muted there. Let me see if I can go ahead and um, help with that. Give me one moment here. Okay. Um, yep, so sorry. You know, as I was, um, I was saying, you are unmuted now, um, I believe. So if you can go ahead and actually and comment on that, um, I'm sure that I'd just love to hear your take. Sure, yeah, no, I think the GEM program is really unique in the sense that it has a focus on the energy industry. Uh, I think uh, an MBA program, as you said, is, is a little bit more general. Um, and so combining the two with a focus on energy, I think that's going to be really powerful. That's a, that's a key uh, skill set to have as you're entering into this space, uh, particularly in this critical time period. So uh, I think that makes it you know, that's a, a unique uh, differentiating factor of the GEM program versus uh, an M MBA program. Okay, well, purple, well, great. Well, thank you so much for your take on that. I know you talked a little bit too about your experience firsthand to seeing about some of those skills that hindsight's 2020, maybe some of the things that um, 
you don't know what you don't know, right? <laughs> that you saw kind of that class, you're like, wow, six years ago would have been really nice to know how the particular, you know, logistics or kind of price points of these things work and how I can actually apply that too. Um, well, actually, um, to, um, one student has a question here about the micro city. I guess, can you talk a little more about that? Like, is this something that's realistic that we may see in terms of like micro grid or actually individual cities that um, are completely independent in terms of energy? Like what, um, I guess I just really want to know when do you think that will actually take place uh, realistically? Yeah, you know, there are varying uh, opinions about that. Um, you know, I, uh, my personal belief is that, um, that there will be a trend towards uh, distributed and resilient energy sources, particularly as uh, we have more and more natural disasters. Um, you know, I think uh, 2017, there's a record breaking, you know, $306 billion worth of damages due to natural disasters. Um, and so, 300 billion, is that right? A little over 300. 300 billion, yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, I think it's going to be more important, more and more important to have uh, resilient forms of power. Microgrids are a great way to do that. Um, you know, you can sort of envision a future, not too distant future, where you may have, uh, you know, a series of interconnected microgrids. And so, um, you know, how do we transmit power through that network? How do we uh, utilize that distributed um, energy network to um, to really deliver, uh, you know, sustainable and and uh, and resilient, reliable power? Uh, that's going to be a challenge for everyone. Perfect. Well, great. And um, actually, someone actually had a, a question um, here about I think I, I believe you mentioned earlier about. Among the other roles as the GEM executive in residence, you know, you do some guest lectures, that, that small lunch, and also kind of like some one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, they want to know, I guess, well, what does that entail, or like what what can that one-on-one -on -one session look like for those that are looking for just advice, mentorship? Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. It's a uh, it's uh, any and everything. So, um, uh, I you know, historically or uh, the past one-on-one -on -one sessions I've had. A lot of that has been, um, you know, how do I get into the renewable energy industry or what are some of the skill sets that I need to get into the renewable energy industry? Um, and so I've been happy to, to have those discussions and uh, introduce them to the right folks in my network and, uh, you know, try to get them positions um, so they can get started in the renewable energy industry. Um, so uh, there's, you know, career advice or if they have uh, questions about, you know, sort of the inner workings of how projects work, you know, what are some of the uh, key things we need to know about solar PV development, for example. You know, happy to share any of that. Wonderful. Well, great. It looks like we just have one more question here as the last one. Um, seeing that you have, you know, working for Panasonic and Panasonic City now, what would you say are the biggest competitors uh, that someone wants to know? Or I guess kind of like companies that well, here, let me backtrack. I think I know what the student's trying to say is that Panasonic's maybe, if you think of them, you don't necessarily think of microgrid or micro cities. Are there any other companies similar to that that are, I guess, expanding um, the different areas of the company like that um, in the Colorado area, just in general, um, that, you, that you keep track of? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting space um, because it's not... Uh, I would say Panasonic doesn't really have a direct competitor in this space, at least not the way that we approach things, um, because a lot of our work is done on the front end through strategic consulting and stakeholder alignment, you know, bringing all the key stakeholders together to solve these problems, um, you know, in lockstep, because uh, you can't do one thing um, with just one entity, um, especially with these types of complex problems. Um, so, you know, there's that component and then tech and then from a technology perspective, you know, Panasonic is a is an innovative uh, company uh, developing in specifically in the energy space. Uh, we manufacture solar modules we manufacture lithium ion batteries. Um, so we've got sort of from a from a technology solutions provider uh, perspective, we, we, you know, we bring that um, expertise as well. And so we try to put both of those together. Uh, so we're not just consulting and we're not just a technology solutions provider trying to sell you products. Um, I, I think there are lots of companies that, that kind of do one of those, uh, but not a lot of companies that, can, that are able to do both. 
Wonderful. Well, yeah, no. And of course I would say, you know, if there were competitors, you know, they, well, they don't have you working there unless you have a doppelganger we don't know about. So of course, you know, they have a little bit of an edge to that, but, but no, I, I think it's just really interesting how, uh, you know, there are some companies, yeah, like larger ones that it'll be interesting to see like if they invest more, you know, in this particular space, uh, you know, with that. So, well, with that, we are going to go ahead and um, stop the webinar here. Uh, once again, thank you everyone so much for attending and, in case you didn't get enough of my picture before, here it is one more time. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Glenn Engelberg. I work with all prospective students here, those just interested in the program. So if you have any questions on the master's degree, uh, certificate options here, my phone number and email are right there. Please feel free to contact me at any time. And that is my direct line as well. And in the meanwhile, I wish everyone a wonderful rest of your day and afternoon. And thank you so much for coming. And of course, Yoon, thank you so much for sharing your Thank insight you. and wisdom and yeah it, honestly it's a really exciting space and i believe as you mentioned to, to sum up here it's a very exciting time uh with all the growth in that right now and i know that gem program um and thanks to your help is you know trying to become uh, a bigger piece of that so thank you so much again yeah thank you appreciate it absolutely all right well everyone take care and have a wonderful rest of your day and afternoon